when we have pancakes, I want the fancy, because I'm not satisfied with anything else. Dad always used to say, a farmer don't drink sour milk, do they? Well, by God, we're going to have the best syrup we can make, too. And we always did. We always saved the best for ourselves. And if I can't have fancy, I don't want any. There you go, baby. I love this place. I love the people in the kingdom. I've lived here my whole life, and I'll die here. So that's just the way that's going to be. My sugaring was I took a box of beer to another sugar house. We sat down, we told lies, and I watched them sugaring. That's what I used to do. I was at a logging expo in Burlington, and I happened to see a CDL booth. So I went over and asked them. I said, can you pump sap uphill? Next thing you know, the owners from CDL were here. Pick and Shovel was here, because that's who we buy all our stuff through. It was quite an extraordinary process. Of course, being a brand new system and me being new at it, Cameron's walked me right through it from pick and shovel. Ronnie's walked me right through it. If Ronnie don't have an answer, he gets me an answer. There's a lot of times I didn't think it was gonna happen last year, but it did. Ronnie has been a, a godsend. He's taken an incredible pressure off from my shoulders. Whether it's one, two, three o'clock in the morning, we're coming. So if you need us, we're there. Cameron's uh, just super, super dedicated. Uh, at least a half a dozen times during the season last year, he slept in his uh, service truck. They want quick and somebody loyal they can trust to go in the sugar house all the time and uh, get the job done, right? I've been thinking about this for a long time. You know, every year you boil over there, and you're like, well, this could be better. And He's loved maple sugaring ever since he did it with his dad. It's always been his big dream to build a big, beautiful sugar house. Been pushing as much as I can all week to help Mark out. We're gonna get some cabinets made and the big, and the bar area made. We've got some help from a few other people, so hopefully this will be a lot more efficient. I guess that would be my dream, <laughs> is to do it full time. Last year we made uh, 200 gallons and that was great for us. You see that sap coming in, it's like, wow. You put on more taps on this line and this line's coming in better now. And you know, next year you say, well, we can get 100 more out there. And just to see that sap coming in that building, it's just something about it that <laughs> I love it. He traded his upright piano for a used barrel evaporator. The guy who made that trade helped him get started. We're all engineers and we're standing there going, how does this work? There was another sugar maker nearby. His front pan was just boiling and boiling and ours was this tiny little frothy boil. It's a lot of work, but it gets you out in the fresh air. Otherwise, I'd be sitting on the couch watching, you know, Judge Judy or something. <laughs> I'm a fifth generation sugar maker that I know of. But back then, just about everybody did it because you needed some syrup, A, for your family, and B, sometimes it was just easier to trade maple sugar versus pulling out cash. This museum, it's fully functional as a sugar house still, so people can watch it being made and taste it right off the evaporator. For me, it's still fun, something you really kind of want to do every year. Part of that I always hated about sugar and was cleaning up after. And now I just tell Steve I can't hurt. <laughs> that old school cupola, steam, wood, snow, quintessential, this is Vermont sugaring. Think about it. There's stuff circulating in these trees that we're collecting. You're eating what Mother Nature has produced, you know, and they think it's delicious. Pretty fortunate the whole family comes. Sometimes that's all that's here. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of late nights. They've always worked hard and they've definitely earned what they have. They didn't come from anything, that's for sure. They've been kind of a role model where me and my sister and brother-in-law are all the same way. Seems like a lot of the sugar land is getting bought up by larger consumers and it's just the way it goes. I'm fortunate to be able to come and help the Colburn Sugar. Beginning of the season, ice creates a lot of problems. It's breaking fittings, ice is involved, it's a headache. If you're broke down during sugaring, which is a short period, you, you can't afford to be broke down during sugaring. You can't miss a drop. You can't miss a day. You can't miss any of it, because you can't make it back up. Mother Nature's a mean bitch. She uh, does her own thing, and you got to be able to keep up with her. 
dumping 150 gallons of syrup on the ground. It's pretty hard to take and I'm not over it yet. <laughs> Everybody thinks this is a perfect, idyllic life, but they don't see how relentless it is. It's relentless. A moose came through or coyotes have been chewing. You go in the woods and you fix every leak in your vacuum system. During chug run, anything can go wrong. My RO is down and I've got to get it fixed because my sap is running or my pump is down. You can't wait during sugar season. Pumping sap is a whole nother challenge in itself. We're pumping sap 3.2 miles. Our pump line blew up a few times. The only way I can explain it is it's a 911 call. You call, and boy, they were here. They were almost like first responders. They were here. Pick and Shovel was here, Cameron, Ronnie, Chris was even here. I know they pushed sap uphill. I don't know if they've pushed it this much of an elevation and this far. We don't get to choose. You know, we're at the mercy of Mother Nature. I don't think they realized that some of the extent of the freezing and the thaws and, you know, it's it was more than what people anticipated over there. CDL got on board. We got it band-aided together to get through the season and we made it work and I ended up with another almost 1,900 gallons after the hiccup. CDL's on the leading edge of technology. They're not afraid to. They probably went back to their engineers and said, this is the case scenario we've got. This pump line didn't work out. We're gonna make good on it and we're gonna go to bat and they're gonna make it work. This will be a story to tell next year. Let's get through this season. Let's be successful at it. Pretty confident that we, we have the problem solved. Uh, if we do, they're going to drastically expand their operation. Plus, uh, they're going to put monitoring in for the complete woods, the tank levels, put your iPad. The monitoring comes up and tells you how much sap's in your tanks. It tells you vacuum all your different stations. It tells you uh, you're all set for the next four hours. Every now and again, people lose their footing. My hat goes off to Russell. He made a great season of what could have been a train rack. Great operation they got going on up there. and Pretty pleased that they put their faith in us to uh, to move forward, they could have chose any company they wanted. I got total faith in uh, Pick and Shovel, and I got total faith in CDL that no matter what it takes, they're gonna make this right. They've made a lot of changes over there, and I think he's got his boots laced up pretty tight for this season. Everybody's always looking for another maple tree. They could probably think of 10 other places if they make this work, they can use it in a different aspect of how they're gonna get it around a mountain, over a mountain. Something does happen here, and you have to go somewhere, you're gonna go with Pick and Shovel. <laughs> I've called Chris, the owner of Pick and Shovel, at 11 o'clock at night. I know he's sleeping. Sorry. I got sap coming in. This is the way this is going to roll. And he picks the phone up. And he's good natured. He's not like, really? Yep, I'll get somebody on it right now, Russ. That's just the way it is. Very few places, even the manufacturers themselves, can say that they're going to be open from seven o'clock in the morning until eight o'clock, seven days a week. It just isn't gonna happen. So I mean, Pick and Shovel has people that drive 60 or 70 miles on a weekend just to get some sugar and supplies because they can't get them at their local places. So what Pick and Shovel has done for the industry is fantastic, because out of this world. You know? They want inventory, they want to be able to come in and, and grab what they need and go, and they want the service to back up the sale. I used to have 10 trees in the back of my parents' yard. I'm about 1,500 total. I'm right around 1,000. We should be getting close to 10,000 taps in a few years. 2740. 6,000. 1,500 taps, I'd be real happy with that. We're doing about 9,000 and we buy set from another three. Roughly 7,500. 11,000. Now we're at 43,000. We're hoping to have 75 to 90,000 taps. Whether they have 200 taps or 200,000 taps, they're a sugar maker. We bought a small RO, which compared to some of the stuff he sold this year, that's peanuts, came and helped us set it up. And Ronnie treats us like we spent 50,000 there, you know? To me, that means a lot. Our philosophy here at the Pig and Shovel is that we will exceed any limit to helping our customer. If our customer needs help, we'll get what they want. We'll make sure that their needs are met. They're my family. They're going to help me. and. That's the way it is. I think anybody would help anybody during this time of year. Dave Boomer and his, and his sons and his whole family, they help us out a lot. And it turns out in a couple of weeks, Dave is having back surgery. We're going to go tap for him. Dan was uh, at the hospital with his wife having his child born and left his uncle to operate the sugar house. And everything in this sugar house but the windows came from us. The roofing, the door, all the equipment inside came from us. 
Terry had never done a lot of it, so um, we came over and made sure that he was in good shape while Dan was at the hospital. Well, Eric LeBlanc, Sugar House burns down. They couldn't have been any deeper into the maple season than they were. And you know, they turned their back to the burnt Sugar House, stepped in that sap truck, turned, turned the wheel, steering wheel the other direction, kept right on hauling to a new sap tank. Brother-in-law, Sugar House or not, somebody was gonna make sure his syrup got made. And if it wouldn't have been Mark, it would have been another sugar maker. Every neighbor helps every neighbor. It's just the way it is. Genuine people that scratch a living out any way they can. During sugar season, everybody gets together and they can't wait to share how they're doing, how their product is. It's the Vermont way. Sugaring is just a part of life up here. Growing up in this area, it just goes along with the territory. That's how I met my husband, was up in the sugar one. Vermont Maple's just full of rich heritage and, and fifth generation family farms and, and hard working people out in the woods. We started sugaring when I was four and a half years old in March of 42. And I sugared until 88. He and I have had a few deals and he paid me with fancy syrup. Now, I don't give a damn if he put light, light amber golden bullshit on it. I want fancy and that's what I've got. The market has not kept pace with the exponential growth in the maple industry. So a lot of our producers are concerned about where are we going to put all this syrup? Who's going to buy it? How do we market it? If we sell in barrels, we want to get into retail. How do we do that? It's a lot of work. It would be so much easier just to sell it in the drum at the end of sugaring season and be done. Yeah, I think the wholesalers have control. The middle guy seems to be making all the money. The producer actually gets squeezed more and more and more. I've heard a lot of people say, I don't know if it's really going to be worth it anymore. As people start to feel the pressure from lower bulk prices, that they are going to be thinking outside of the box, different uses for it, um, different, more creative ways to use maple syrup. Everybody makes maple syrup. We need to do something different. They need to find that market. They need to create it, you know, make their own mustard or barbecue sauce or maple milk or whatever it is they want to make and they can find a market for it, that's huge. I always wanted to write a cookbook because I love to cook, and I would do food with maple syrup in it. I wanted to show how awesome of an ingredient it is, how diverse it is. People are looking for all natural, healthy, organic alternatives. This is sap. Mountain bikers, hikers, cross-country skiers, they love this product because it's natural energy and it's just delicious. All we have to do is replace a portion of what people are using sugar in already with maple and we'll take care of a lot of the overproduction. They say that only 2% of the population of the world has ever tasted real maple syrup. You can use granulated maple sugar any place you use white sugar. The only difference is that you get a higher quality sugar, better health ramifications. You're getting manganese, riboflavin, zinc, magnesium, calcium, potassium. It's a more complete food. We never bought any white White sugar. My wife used to do all our cooking, make bread and everything with syrup. We used a dark syrup to flavor beans with. We used syrup when we was pickling our own pans of bacon. I'm thrilled at what they're able to do. Because anything that they can do, they will open new markets and a potential benefit to everyone in Vermont. Tea, liquor, cream, bourbon-infused maple syrup or rum-infused maple syrup. I think the next burgeoning industry will be wrapped around birch syrup. You can basically use your same equipment. It starts after the maple season is pretty well done. Consumers right now, they want legacy and history and a story behind it. And if Vermont maple doesn't have that, you know, I don't know what does. Chris saw that the future or you had an idea, you know, that this was a growing industry. And if you'd seen this department 10 years ago, you know, it was 12 feet inside the store and we had a few buckets and some taps and he built this sugaring department on his back overnight in some respect. It's very rewarding to have them have a successful crop. For us is the reward at the end of the season to prove that we've done what we should be doing. The level of commitment during the season, that they'll answer their phones any time of the day if, if they know there's a question that they can answer. They know just as well as I that it's a very short window for the sugar maker to make his profit. And their paycheck may come written out from the pick and shovel, but it certainly is uh, every one of our customers that supports that. Pick and shovel, baby! <laughs> I think sugar making is addictive because we're simply Vermonters and it's what we love yeah. to do. I'm addicted just because of seeing all your hard work go into that shed. You see that sap coming in, it's like, wow. The best thing is the smell. 
you get so used to it, sometimes I'll walk outside and come back in just so you get another <laughs> hit of it, you know? Sap always came in, I'd go in there in the morning and just look, and there was just never enough and never enough, and I was always looking for more trees, and she hasn't always went along with it, but... Uh, <laughs> it's never ending. <laughs> it is addicting, and the people you meet, it's crazy. I bet I've had 100 people when I was boiling come into the sugar house. I never knew them. I knew them when they left. It was pretty neat. You don't have to get all dressed up. You don't have to be somebody you're not. Every time we light that fire, there's a half a dozen people here, it seems like. And they know the weather. They know their boomers boiling. Let's go, you know? But the little yearly shit thing, I'd say it's probably the sixth or seventh year we've had it. It's more about having fun and making friends. Good time. Everybody's laughing. And Hooting and hollering. Hooting and hollering, yeah. <laughs> Everybody gets together and has fun. and. It keeps for a nice neighborhood where you invite everyone and everybody joins in. That's why you want women tapping your trees. Come on. You want like a light touch. <laughs> I call the April's Maple Christmas Express. And I had a little girl in here last week that repeatedly asked her mother if they could get on the train. <laughs> and her mother had to say, it's not a real train, honey. <laughs> it's changed wicked. I call myself Maple Horse. If we got 40,000, we want 50. If I go broke, I will go borrow some money so I can keep sugar in. I got new long underwear. I'm really excited. That's <laughs> what my friends are saying. Oh, I can't wait for it to be 80 degrees out. And I'm like, no, not yet. <laughs> you're out in the woods. You're out in the country. The whole family and cousins and whatnot. <laughs> dances all the time. And it's probably not the best dancer in the Northeast Kingdom. faster you process the sap. From the tree to the barrel, the better the ball. That was in the tree this morning. It's so deeply rooted in tradition and in family that you can't help but feel happy about what you're doing, about the joy you're experiencing yourself and the joy that you're sharing with other people. The only known sugar maker here is this one, but <laughs> you're going to start here at one of these things. <laughs> it's really something how much it's grown. We'll see if we spend more money every year. A lot going on from walking your bushes for leaf, putting up your pipeline, making sure your vacuum pumps are working, cleaning releasers. It's a big process in a little package. Did you know about this? It was like the Taj Mahal of sugar houses. I enjoy being in the woods. I mean, there's no better place. Just be happy. Being able to put your heart and soul into it. Just be able to live with the land and do what you want to do. That's living. That is not what I call living. Do it. Just do it. It's a blast. It's not that hard. I'm not the brightest light bulb, so I caught on to it.